the path to product development is just, I mean, if you look at what it takes to get products um, out, it's paved with mistakes. And what we learn from the story is that even large companies with great market data and, and immense resources can make mistakes. But we want to learn how to do this right. And we have the right person to tell us about it. Here to talk about how Wealthsimple redesigned their platform to much success, actually, is Avram Lori, VP of Product. Let's give him a hand. Awesome. Uh, hey, folks. Uh, my name is Avram, uh, and I'm uh, VP of Product at Wellsimple. So my talk today is a story. It's the story of how we redesigned the Wellsimple app, uh, why we did it, how we did it, and uh, what we learned along the way. But first, a little bit about Wellsimple. So quick straw poll, how many of you have heard of Wellsimple? Wow, that's amazing. How many of you are customers of Wellsimple? All right, so the litmus test is, do you believe my talk? <laughs> um, so for those who don't know, um, well, Simple's an online investment manager, um, sometimes called a robo-advisor. Uh, we don't like that term, but feels like we lost that battle. Um, we don't like it because it's at odds with our mission, which is to create a more human financial institution. Simply put, we help people build smart investment portfolios, and give them advice about how to achieve their financial goals. That's what we do. And we advocate for a passive approach to investing. Uh, we don't try and like pick stocks, you know, like winners and losers. In general, that doesn't work. Um, instead, our portfolios are made up of low-cost ETFs or exchange-traded funds. This is just a fancy term to describe large, diversified baskets of stocks and bonds that track an entire economic sector or index like the US bond market or the S&P 500, which you see here. So while Simple was founded in 2014, which is where this chart begins, um, the entire history of our company, from the day we were founded right up until today, where the chart ends, has taken place during the longest bull market ever, over 10 years. Uh, since 2009, uh, the S&P 500 has risen more than 300%. Uh, and while Simple and our customers have benefited greatly from this extended bull market. Um, while this has certainly been a fortuitous time to found an online investment manager, uh, there is an inescapable economic certainty that we've always known. The good times don't last forever. Um, the economy moves in cycles. It expands, it hits a peak, it contracts, it hits a low, and then the cycle repeats. So while our company has only experienced economic expansion so far, we've always known the peak is coming. We just don't know exactly when it'll happen. No one does. In Q4 of last year, indicated by the little red arrow there, um, we started to think that maybe we passed the peak. Uh, let's zoom in a little. So this is the same graph, but with a reduced time scale. So this is just Q3 and Q4 of last year. Um, now a significant drop is a lot more noticeable. Um, so, so what happened? Well, if you recall um, from you know CNN and BNN and whatever, the markets experienced the worst December since the Great Depression. Uh, and we thought this was it, right? The wild ride of 10 years of economic expansion had finally come to an end. We were wrong. Uh, the S&P 500 recovered and continued rising in 2019. But of course, we didn't know that at the time. No one did. Um, Let's, took a, let's take a look at what our customers were experiencing around this time. So the red line that you now see here represents the number of customers who are underwater. So underwater means that their balance is less than their total deposits. In other words, they have less today than they originally put in. So as you can see, around the time the market started to dip, there was a big spike in the number of clients who are underwater. Why is this? Well, well symbol has been growing very, very quickly, uh, more than doubling our total clients each year. As a result, the majority of our clients are actually relatively new to Wellsimple. Many have been with us for less than a year. Um, a dip in the markets 
like this one has a big impact on the portfolios of clients who are still very, very early in their investing journey. Uh, to be clear, this is within expectations. A year is pretty much nothing in the context of your whole life. Uh, over the long term, history has demonstrated pretty consistently that a diversified portfolio will yield positive returns. So what happens when a client is underwater? Well, we looked into it and it turns out they deposit less, a lot less. So let's take a look at that. So here's another chart showing the average monthly deposits per client in an up market when most clients are above water versus a down market when many clients find themselves underwater. So clients deposit around half as much during a down market as they do during an up market. You know, we expected lower deposits in a down market, but we didn't expect to see such a significant drop. We hypothesize that clients deposit less in a down market because they get anxious. Right? They don't want to feel like they're throwing good money after bad. That instinct, while completely understandable, is actually wrong. It implies the client knows the market will continue to drop when in reality it could easily recover tomorrow. We talk a lot about the virtue of long-term thinking in our messaging and our marketing, about ignoring the ups and downs of the markets and drowning out the noise. For example, here's an email we sent to customers in December of 2018, during that uh, tough month for the markets, telling folks to keep calm and carry on. And yet, despite all our efforts, our customers were clearly very affected by what was going on in the markets. So what was happening? Well, we decided to investigate. After a client signs up for Wellsimple, the main way they interact with our company is via our apps. So this seemed like a pretty reasonable place to start our investigation. So during this dip in the markets, what did a cu customer actually experience in our apps? Let's take a look. This is the dashboard. The first, things, the first thing clients see when they log in, and this is what it might look like uh, during a market dip for a new client. So the top of the page, we lead with three big numbers your balance, your total earnings, and your rate of return. Those numbers are provided without much of any context, and in a down market, they don't look so hot, uh, and they can actually fluctuate pretty wildly day to day. Below the big numbers, uh, you can see we list your accounts, and we, again, highlight your earnings by account. Again, in a down market, it looks pretty scary. You know, negative, big negative numbers, that's, that's scary. Uh, and below that, you can just see the top of what we call our future U graph, which is like a projection of what we estimate you'll have in the future. And in a down market, it almost seems like a cruel choke. Uh, you told me how much money I'm losing, and now you want me to be hopeful about the future? That's a bit of a stretch. So the focus of this page is pretty obvious. It's all about market performance. When markets are down, as they were in Q4, the design of this page actually creates a lot of anxiety for our clients. They kind of see it as one giant billboard of why they shouldn't give us more money. Now again, this belief is based on actually a faulty premise, but you know what, that doesn't really matter. Our clients clearly didn't know that, and that's because we had failed to explain that to them. Suffice it to say, you know, we're pretty sure at this point that we'd identified the, the problem. It was our app. Now, you might be wondering why would Wellsimple ever design their app this way? It doesn't seem so great. Well, to answer that, let's take a look at the dashboard during an up market, but this time on mobile. So it's basically the same design, but now it's telling a very different story, a good news story. Right? Look at that amazing rate of return, 7.2%. Those earnings are incredible. Well, Simple's made me so much money. What a great service. So why did we design our app this way? Well, clearly we had succumbed to the same thing that many investors do. We assumed the good times would last forever, at least in terms of how we designed the app. You know, in our marketing, we espouse long-term thinking and staying calm during periods of volatility, and yet our app's design was completely myopic. You know, it worked great in up markets and totally failed in down markets. It actually exacerbated the fear and anxiety the clients were already feeling on their own. We didn't do this consciously, of course. Uh, I mean, you wouldn't even notice the problem during an up market. And remember, Wellsimple hasn't known anything other than a bull market since it was founded. So while we believe we had identified the problem, in order to solve it, 
we needed a deeper understanding of what clients actually experience in both up and down markets, agnostic of our product. So we talked to some clients. What we learned from clients can be grouped into sort of three categories. The first category is understanding. That refers to our clients' understanding of investing. We found that many of our clients had misconceptions about investing. For example, they often underestimate the impact of their own contributions and overestimate the impact of the market on the growth of their savings. They often don't understand how market fluctuations impact their future. They equate up as good, down as bad, when in reality, they're both completely normal and expected in the context of long-term investing. The second category is emotion. And that refers to the feelings clients have when they're investing. And it's obviously very closely tied to the first category. Clients feel like they're winning when markets are up and losing when markets are down. They spend too much time thinking and worrying about the ups and downs of the market, effectively trying to control something that's totally out of their control. I'm a well simple client and I've definitely felt these same exact things. The third and final category is behavior. And this refers to the actions clients take based on A, what they know or what they think they know, and B, how they feel. Basically, the, the first two categories. So we already know people save a lot less for their future when markets are down. They feel like it's throwing good money after bad. We already knew this based on our data, of course, but we hadn't confirmed until now why it was happening. So at this point, we had not only identified the problem, our app, but we also had diagnosed the root cause, how our clients think, feel, and behave in different market conditions. Now we were ready to start solving the problem by redesigning our app. The first step was to define our goals, the basis by which we would evaluate any potential solution. So our goals fell into the same three categories as before. First, understanding. Our, our app should help clients understand how their own activities, their contributions, withdrawals, etc., affect the performance of their portfolio. And related, how these activities actually have a much, much, much bigger impact long-term than the market. Second, emotion. At the end of the day, clients will always experience some worry and anxiety when markets dip, no matter how good our app is. Um, so our goal shouldn't be to eliminate that fear. That's not only impossible, it's also dismissive. Rather, our app should acknowledge this fear and try to reassure clients. Not only that, it should actually make clients feel accomplished for the things they can control, putting money away for their future. Last up, behavior. So our app should inspire clients to stay committed to a long-term investing strategy by taking responsibility for the things they can control and drowning out the noise for the things they can't. So with our goals now clearly defined, we were ready to start embarking on solutions. We started by coming up with a highly divergent set of explorations of what could be, different ways of achieving the goals we had defined. So by way of example, here's two comp concepts we explored. So we came up with a number of explorations that shifted the focus away from past performance, which is a rear view mirror, and towards the future. We hypothesized that a future orientation could elevate the conversation from, is my portfolio performance good or bad, to, am I on track to reach my goals? After all, like a temporary dip in the market is unlikely to knock you off track in the context of your long-term financial goals. We came up with another set of explorations that also shifted the focus away from market performance, but this time towards the one thing you can control, which is your own contributions. We hypothesized that this would achieve greater personal accountability for keeping yourself on track. And instead of feeling like you're winning when markets are up, uh, you'd feel like you're winning so long as you're regularly making deposits and regularly saving for your future. So after refining these concepts a little, we showed them to customers to solicit their feedback. So we learned a lot from this experience, but I want to highlight three key learnings. First, Clients are well-trained to look for performance indicators. Indeed, we had trained them uh, by making performance the focus of the existing application. 
So all our explorations down, downplayed short-term performance some, uh, somewhat. And every single client we spoke to immediately noticed, and some expressed concern. The challenge here is that we had trained our customers to focus on the wrong thing, short-term performance. And now we were trying to change that. But change is hard, so we should expect some resistance to this redesign. Second, a lens into the future is optimistic and motivating, so long as it feels real and credible. The future concepts we presented make clients feel positive about their money's potential for future growth and personally accountable for it, rather than concerned about short-term losses. However, they didn't feel totally credible. They seemed a bit too certain, as though we were trying to like predict the future to a degree of certainty that just didn't seem possible and therefore realistic. Last, clients consistently remark that context helps them understand and interpret performance. While our designs downplayed short-term performance somewhat, whenever we did show it, we were always mindful to include context. The type of context we used differed based on the particular situations. In some cases, it was historical context. A sudden dip in the market doesn't look so scary in the context of the entire lifetime of your portfolio. In other cases, it was human context. A big drop in your portfolio doesn't look so scary if we include the reason it dropped. Maybe you bought a home or sent your kids to college. That's something to be celebrated, not something to be afraid of. By showing these concepts to customers, we quickly validated our ideas and also gleaned valuable insight to help us further refine our approach. No single exploration was a clear winner. Each had something to offer, but wasn't necessarily a complete solution in and of itself. So we worked to consolidate the best ideas into one compelling vision for Wellsimple. It took many, many rounds of iteration, but here's the final result and what we ultimately shipped to customers. But actually, before we dive in, one caveat. This is the final result for now. Uh, at Wellsimple, we like to say we're forever in beta. Case in point, I literally had to update my slides like two days ago because the app had already changed. So uh, gotta keep current. Uh, anyways, onwards to the demo. So first, let's start with the all new dashboard. Uh, what a client sees when they, I think we're skipped ahead somehow. And go back, I believe this is it. I go a slide forward. And one more forward. That, no. And I don't know what this is. This is not one of my slides. <laughs> I literally don't know what it is. <laughs> this is. A, could you go back one, though? Yeah, so this is the actual slide. All right, I, I'm not really sure what's going on here. But uh, the previous slide got swapped out with some random video. Um, OK. Hmm. Uh, well, you probably saw the dashboard very briefly, which is what the client sees when they first log in. So I'm going to describe it to you. <laughs> At the top, there's a graph that shows your portfolio performance over time. That was that graph that was going up and to the right. And it'll almost always go up and to the right uh, if you're making regular contributions. That's affirming and gratifying. Dips in the market seem pretty unconsequential in this context. Like, well, you can't see it. It was a real account showing real data, and I bet you couldn't point out the Q4 downturn. It's a tiny blip in the context of long-term performance. Um, in the future, on that graph that you have to imagine, we plan to annotate it with even more context. For example, big milestones like reaching 50K in your account, or making a withdrawal to buy a home, or starting to save for your child's education. These are things that should be celebrated and recognized to provide a positive and affirming experience. Next up, which is this, we have something called Deposit Insights. This shows your monthly deposits to each one of your accounts. The purpose of this feature is to reinforce the importance of making regular contributions to your investments and feeling accomplished when you do. Now let's dive into an account. Um, I'll open uh, the group uh, RSP. Um, so, we orient the entire account view around the future. Uh, 
which you can skip past. Um, what we're calling your plan. So we lead with a projection of your account growth from now until retirement. That was the cone that you previously saw momentarily. It's calculated based on what you have today, how much you're contributing regularly, and the overall risk level of your portfolio. To ensure that the projection feels credible to clients, we don't show a single outcome, but rather a range of possible outcomes, reflecting the inherent risk of the market. Um, and so below that, we show the other parts of your plan, your ongoing contributions, your portfolio makeup. And as you saw in the last part of that demo, um, was the history tab. This is where we've relegated account performance. It's still really important, but it shouldn't be the focus. It's a rearview mirror into what's already happened, not where you're going. And so we lead with that familiar graph of account value over time, showing net deposits as well as market growth, which again, as long as you're regularly contributing, should be going up into the right. So this has been a glimpse and kind of a bit of a frenetic glimpse, so I apologize, of what we ultimately shipped to customers about a month ago. What are the results so far? Well, it's hard to say. We need a longer time scale than just one month to truly measure our success. Indeed, we need to observe how the app performs in a variety of different market conditions. And frankly, I'm not exactly rooting for a recession just because it would help me prove that our redesign worked. But we're not totally in the dark. We always have customer feedback. So first up, the good news. Lots of people not only seem to like the redesign, they also seem to get it too. Customers have been reflecting a lot of the underlying rationale back to us, which is always a good sign. For example, clients have demonstrated greater awareness of their own contributions, which indicates that they're taking more personal accountability for their savings. Also, customers have indicated that they appreciate the context whenever we show performance because it helps them see the big picture and avoid the pitfalls of short-term focus. But it's not all sunshine and rainbows. A small but vocal minority have not loved the redesign. And having lived through a couple major redesigns in my career, it's not a huge surprise to me. As I mentioned before, people generally don't like change, especially when they don't perceive a problem with the status quo. That said, all feedback is a gift, uh, and many users have brought up very valid issues to our attention, some of which we've already started to address. So at this point in the story, you've caught up to the present day. But clearly the story isn't over. In fact, it'll never be over. There's always room to iterate and improve, and one day, I'm fairly confident, we'll tear it all down again and redesign the app all over again. Before I conclude here, I'd like to go back to something I said at the very beginning of our, this presentation, which is our mission. Now, while simple, our mission is to create a more human financial institution. As a product leader, the way I support that mission is by trying to build a more human financial product. What does that mean really? And why should you care? Building products for humans means acknowledging what it is to be human. In a domain like finance, it's all too easy to think in cold, precise terms and therefore build cold, precise products. But humans aren't cold or precise. We're messy, we're emotional, we're stressed out, we're scared. And the products we need to build should acknowledge that truth. So the story I've told you today is how we tried to do that at Well Simple. And you should care because it's universal. It's applicable to practically every product imaginable. Embrace humanity and all the vulnerability that comes with it, and you'll get a better product, a more empathetic product, a more compassionate product, a more human product. Thank you. All right, everyone, we've got time for a few questions for Avram. Uh, so here we go. Raise your hand if you've got one. Hi, Avram. Thank you for your presentation. It was really nice and complete. And as a customer of Well Simple myself, I saw myself represented there. So thank you. Um, I was just wondering, because I read a little bit about how the product works. And you guys have an algorithm as well as people with uh, experience in finance and investments looking into it, right? So how are you guys preparing in terms of like the algorithm testing 
or even interface testing for a recession if it ever comes? Is there something you're changing or? I think, uh, I think the thing is that fundamentally our investing strategy will not change. Um, the team of investment researchers that we have, the team of portfolio managers that we have, uh, build plans that ultimately should be agnostic to what is currently happening in the market. Our models build out sort of expectations that some markets will be down, some years will be down years, and some years will be up years, and some quarters will be down and some will be up. But again, based on historical experience at Well Simple and frankly, the market over the last hundred years, we're fairly confident that a sort of consistent and sustained investment strategy that doesn't try and be reactive in the context of the markets is actually the right approach. Um, so I think the only thing we're trying to do is make sure that our communications and our product experience uh, work agnostic of what's going on in the market and really take that future sort of future focused lens uh, and a long term lens. Uh, thanks, Avram. Uh, just a curious question as to, obviously the big inflection point was understanding what customers see when they first log in. You know, um, how did you guys, what was the process you came up to, to understand that, that aha moment? Uh, was that user research? Was it something uh, you came up internally? Or I'm just curious to how you came about to, to recognize that uh, situation. Well, a couple of things. One is that I think at WellSimple we have the benefit of uh, being customers of WellSimple. Now, as a product manager, you should never be like uh, myopic about your understanding of that you may be one of the customers, but you're not the only kind of customers. But it at least gave us a hint of potentially something being wrong uh, because we were feeling anxious as customers of WellSimple. But I think there was a lot of channels that we had that where we were consistently hearing the same things. Uh, our customer support, constantly hearing uh, concern and anxiety ramp up when markets are down. We saw tweets to this effect. And at the end of the day, we started to question, I mean, what, what started this was the, the impetus to actually solve it was the Q4 downturn, but we've had you know, minor downturns before, and every time it happens, we always saw a bunch of different signals that sort of indicated that something wasn't working right, that our, that our marketing wasn't sufficient to sort of um, help our clients understand this sort of long-term perspective and the sort of the keep calm and carry on mentality. And so I, I don't think it was any one source. It was just sort of like starting to recognize patterns that when something happens, our customer sort of behavior and sort of reaction to the use of the product fundamentally changes. Um, once you see that two or three times, you start to realize, you start to recognize the pattern and eventually we prioritize acting on it because we recognize that like these are the signs of things that will come and will probably last for not quarters but potentially years. Um, so how do we prepare our customers for that kind of a, um, a reality? So. Um, Thanks, everyone. Great talk. Uh, we had another talk by uh, the like product manager at Tinder, and what I personally really admire about both these products is it's based around establishing trust with the user. And as a young investor, I can attest how like I'm very impressed by how fascinatingly well well simple is tackled the problem. I'd really appreciate if you could talk a bit more about how you consciously included that as a part of your product strategy. Like, how did building trust with the user inform your product strategy specifically? Right. Um, it's interesting. It's an interesting question. Um, I think as a tangible example, uh, I can point to our future projections uh, that we provide the customers. Cause Originally, they didn't feel credible. And lack of credibility is sort of synonymous with lack of trust, right? And so um, it was interesting because we were trying to get people to embrace this like long-term perspective by showing them a long-term projection. But if they don't fundamentally believe in your methodology or even understand your methodology, then that's kind of a fool's errand, 
right? We can we try and reassure them about the future all we want, but if they don't believe us, uh, kind of the game's over. Uh, so I mentioned in terms of what I in terms of what we quickly showed uh, a projection that kind of tries to be credible and accurate by showing like a range of possible outcomes. It's worked, but as an example, it's not perfect. We're actually working on some revs on the future projection as I speak today. And um, I think what we've learned is that uh, for folks who still potentially doubt, you know, the methodology behind something like a future projection, which is in and of itself an educated guess, providing access to more of the methodology for those who want it is something that helps establish that trust. Now there's a segment of folks for whom that methodology would be noise, it would be complexity, it would actually deter from the simplicity of the ultimate of, of, the, of the application. But for a subset that really wants to know the details, we need to make sure that those are accessible and transparent, and they know how it works. So I would argue that um, you know, some of the key lessons that we continue to learn about the redesign is about transparency and making information accessible to the people who want it. We need to give them a hand. That's what needs to happen. Thank you so much, Andrew.